uh, Jonathan Wasserman is a pediatric endocrinologist and associate professor at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. He also serves as a project investigator of genetics and genome biology at the Research Institute. Dr. Wasserman's research focuses primarily on pediatric thyroid cancer and spans both clinical and translational domains. His research includes genetics and genomics of pediatric papillary thyroid cancer, healthcare utilization patterns among young patients with thyroid cancer at diagnosis and during follow-up, and the identification of prediction models to improve assessment of thyroid nodules in children and to gauge malignant potential. He received his medical training at Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and subsequently pursued an internship and residency in pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Boston. He previously earned a PhD and completed postdoctoral training in genetics at the University of Cambridge, England. Dr. Wasserman serves as co-chair of the American Thyroid Association's Pediatric Thyroid Cancer Guidelines. Take it away. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thanks to everyone who's participating. Um, it's always a highlight of my year to, to join the Thyca conference and to be part of this, which is, is really a, a wonderful conference, and I really value the opportunity. Um, and so, so I was asked to talk today, I'm a, a, I was asked to talk today about differences between thyroid cancer in children and in adults. And uh, over the next um, 45 minutes or so, I hope I'll be able to share with you where the, where the disease differs between the two um, and welcome questions and discussion at the end. Um, so before I get going, uh, just a little bit about myself and Lindsay already covered a little bit of this. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children, also formerly known as Sick Kids now. Um, and my clinical focus is, is both on endocrine cancers in children, but also in endocrine diseases um, in childhood cancer survivors. Um, and finally, I'm a proudly Canadian and a hockey dad and coach, and these are my my two boys and hockey season starts tomorrow for us. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little story um, to introduce the topic about a family that I care for. Uh, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll serve as a model to illustrate some of the uh, features that we're gonna be discussing over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, this is Hari and, and not his real name or face, this is borrowed from the internet, but Hari is a 10 year old boy um, and he was taking a selfie for his Instagram page. He's sort of looking up at his camera and he noticed something looked different about his neck um, and went in to see his family physician uh, who arranged for an ultrasound and that showed a two and a half centimeter mass in the right lobe of his thyroid gland. Um, in addition, there were a number of abnormal appearing lymph nodes in his neck. Uh, and to inv investigate further, he underwent a CAT scan and the CAT scan showed uh, numerous innumerable tiny spots in his lungs suspicious for metastatic disease. Hari then underwent a total thyroidectomy with bilateral lateral neck dissection um, and a single course of radioactive iodine therapy. Uh, and this was, this was particularly um, curious and uh, somewhat distressing to the family because Hari's mother, uh, Sangeeta, uh, who at the time was 48 years old, um, had also had a similar experience a few years ago. Uh, in contrast to Hari, he uses Instagram and TikTok. She uses Facebook um, and she doesn't do selfies. Uh, she came to medical attention uh, at a routine family doctor visit. Uh, he, her family doctor felt a lump in her neck um, and she too had an ultrasound that showed a two and a half centimeter mass in the right lobe of her thyroid gland. In contrast to her son, there were no abnormal lymph nodes on the ultrasound. Uh, and she underwent a thyroid lobectomy, only half of her thyroid gland was removed and underwent no further treatment. And five years down the line, she remains well. And, and finally, to complete the picture is Monica. Uh, Monica was a 15 year old young lady who uh, Hari and Sangeeta actually met at a previous Thyka survivors meeting um, and have continued to correspond with her over the years. Uh, she's a 15 year old girl uh, who had a two and a half centimeter thyroid nodule. She had a few abnormal lymph nodes in the central neck and she underwent a total thyroidectomy 
with what's called the central neck dissection. So the lymph nodes immediately adjacent to the thyroid gland were removed. Uh, she did not undergo radioactive iodine therapy. And again, five years out from her initial diagnosis, there's no evidence of disease. So it, it brings to mind the question of what's the difference between these three individuals? Um, what causes their disease and their treatment to be distinct? Um, and a number of possible contributors are listed here. Is it based on their age? Uh, is it their sex? We've got two, two young women and one young man. Uh, they're of distant, distant, different ethnicities, and perhaps they had different exposures or different risks. Um, genetics may play a cause, and perhaps the differences are purely ascribed to pure chance. So over the next half hour to 45 minutes, I'm going to try to discuss comparisons between who develops thyroid carcinoma, and specifically I'm going to focus on the most common subtype of thyroid carcinoma called papillary thyroid carcinoma. And what does that look like in childhood versus in adulthood? Um, what are the characteristics of the disease in different age groups? What about the diagnostic tests that we use? Are they equally valid in children and in adults? Um, do we treat children and adults the same? Or should we be treating children and adults the same? What happens in the long term? What are the outcomes? And how do we put all of this together into caring for patients and involving integrating patients in their care and their future health? So the initial understanding of thyroid cancer in children uh, actually arose in the 1950s with the initial description, at least the, the, the first description that I'm aware of, of thyroid cancer in children. But perhaps it was best crystallized um, in the modern era by a publication that came out in the mid 1990s. And, and this is a figure from that publication. Um, and what it shows down here is the age of patients at the time they were diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And these two lines show the rates of recurrence of the thyroid cancer. And the dotted line is whether or not the individual died as a result of their diagnosis. And what you can see from this figure is that children are, were at the time much, much more likely to have recurrence, have the thyroid cancer return after initial treatment. Um, but when you compare them to adults, particularly the adults uh, diagnosed in their 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, mortality was, was almost non-existent in children. Um, so higher recurrence, but lower case fatality rate. Um, so, so this begged a lot of questions and we've now got almost 30 years more of understanding and information on how to make these distinctions um, and how to uh, care for and what to expect of the disease in the, in the two different age groups. Uh, or, or if we wanna consider adolescence and young adulthood a separate age group with three different age groups. So I'm gonna to try to proceed over the next uh, little while by answering a number of discrete questions. Uh, and the first question is, is who develops thyroid cancer? And not specifically what are the risk factors, which are fairly limited, um, but you know, what age and what sex um, is most likely to develop thyroid cancer? Um, and this is a figure from an international cancer registry specific to thyroid cancer. And again, we're looking at age across the bottom um, and the rates of diagnosis um, are represented by these two lines. The green is women uh, and the red is men. And you can see right away that women are much more likely uh, to be diagnosed with thyroid cancer than men. And it peaks in their fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh decade of life. If we're looking only at the pediatric age group, that really only constitutes 2% of all thyroid cancer diagnoses. Uh, and this is really relevant or important to me as a pediatric endocrinologist, because it, in some ways it may limit what we understand about disease if we're talking about thyroid cancer in general and knowing whether or not we can extrapolate our knowledge of thyroid cancer overall to this 2%, this lower 2% group. Um, and you can also see a couple of interesting things here. Really, the likelihood of diagnosis of thyroid cancer is very low 
in the first decade of life. Um, but when it is diagnosed, it's diagnosed roughly uh, at equal rates between boys and girls. And the rates of diagnosis really skyrocket into the teenage years. And probably um, the cue for this is puberty. Um, and that's also when the distinctions between males and females uh, start to become clearer. Just focusing on the pediatric age group, so under 18 or under 19 actually, um, this is just show, showing the distribution. So if you're looking at children with thyroid cancer, the majority of those children with thyroid cancer are young women in their teenage years. Um, next is young men in their teenage years. And again, the under 12 group um, is much, much smaller and constitutes only about 10% of thyroid cancer diagnoses in childhood. So the next question is, are not thyroid nodules in children equally likely to be cancerous versus nodules in adults. And nodules in children are fairly rare and it depends what study we look at, um, but anywhere from two to 20% of children at some point in their life, uh, in their childhood may be found to have a thyroid nodule if one goes to look for it by doing an ultrasound. Um, in adults, that number can be as high as anywhere from 50 to 70% of individuals may have a thyroid nodule. So it's quite common in adults. Uh, in, in adults, we know that the likelihood that a nodule is cancerous is quite low. Um, but to answer this question, um, I'll refer to a study that came from my colleagues in Boston, um, where I had done some of my training. Um, and this was done at a combined clinic where they see both children and adults with thyroid nodules. Um, and they looked at all the patients over a, over a specific time period that presented to their clinic with a thyroid nodule greater than one centimeter. Um, and in children, when you look at all, uh, all children, 125 children with thyroid nodules, about 22% of them, or exactly 22% of them were cancerous. Um, compare that to the adults where the rate was uh, significantly lower it was 14%, and even that's probably an overestimate um, based on the fact that this is at a, a specialized hospital with a, with a specific endocrine clinic. So they may have had uh, higher likelihood of referrals for individuals that had cancer. And, and the general estimates for adults are somewhere between five and 10% risk of malignancy. So all things aside, a child with a thyroid nodule is more likely to be diagnosed with cancer than an adult with a thyroid nodule. So once faced with a child that has a thyroid nodule, the next question is, well, how do we evaluate that thyroid nodule and how do we actually determine whether or not it's cancerous or not and whether it needs to be treated? Can we use the same tools that we use in adults? And, and many of you in the audience will know that the tools that are typically used in adults include ultrasound. Um, and that study I just showed you was, was an ultrasound clinic. Um, and if the ultrasound is sufficiently concerning, then uh, a fine needle biopsy is performed. Um, and potentially uh, now over the past five to 10 years, molecular tests have become far more common. When the ultrasound is performed, uh, the physician performing the ultrasound We'll look at different features of a thyroid nodule to try to classify how suspicious this is for being cancerous. Um, this is one approach that's used. It's called the ATA risk stratification system. It's one of about five or six, and, and I'm only showing you one uh, because that's not really the focus. But based on some of the features of the nodule, the system will classify risk or level of concern into high suspicion intermediate suspicion, low suspicion, very low suspicion, or clearly non-cancerous or benign. And this has been developed and validated for adults and, and it's fairly reproducible and fairly accurate, but not clear because the, the system was not developed with children in mind, not clear whether these same categories and particularly these same risk levels would apply to children. 
Um, so a number of years ago, a colleague of mine who's now in Ottawa, Claudia Martinez Rios, looked at using this particular system, but applying it to children who had been seen uh, at our hospital, who had undergone both thyroid ultrasound as well as diagnostic testing or follow-up. Um, and she classified all, all of the ultrasounds into those ATA categories. Um, and, and what she found was that the ATA system was quite reliable at the extremes. If the ATA predicted that this was a benign nodule, it probably was. If the ATA was highly suspicious that this was cancer, it probably was. Um, but there are some categories in the middle where it wasn't as helpful um, at distinguishing um, one from the other. Um, and in fact, if we consider these, those rates, and these are the rates I showed you on the previous slide, for those intermediate, very low, low and intermediate risk, the likelihood of, it, of a nodule being cancerous if it was a child was actually significantly higher than if it was an adult. So a child with an intermediate risk pattern was somewhere in the order of 40% risk of, develop, of having a cancer versus 10 to 20% in adults. So the next question is what about biopsy? And, and a biopsy is done in children always with ultrasound guidance. A very thin needle is inserted into the nodule and some cells are removed to try to classify whether or not they're cancerous or, or not. Uh, and those cells are examined on a microscope slide by a cytopathologist. And like with the ATA ultrasound, the uh, cytology or the cells evaluation are divided into different categories of increasing level of concern. Um, this is called the Bethesda system and it's Bethesda one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and the Bethesda six um, in adults is almost close to 100% likelihood that this is a cancer, whereas a Bethesda 2 is almost 100% likelihood that this is not a cancer. And so this table actually summarizes a number of different studies which looked at applying, again, this adult developed cytology system to pediatric samples. And interestingly, like with the ultrasound, within a given category, when we perform a biopsy in a child, the likelihood that that nodule is cancerous or is malignant is higher than the adult risk prediction would anticipate. Um, so both adult ultrasound and cytology criteria underestimate the malignancy rates in children. And, and this is particularly important depending on where any of these tests are done. And if it's done at an ultrasound lab or read by a cytopathologist who isn't highly experienced in pediatric literature, they may undercall um, an ultrasound. And it's important that whoever is treating the child be able to put the results in the context of the pediatric data. If you look back at this slide, there were three categories, three, four, and five, that are not clearly benign and not clearly cancerous. These are what we call indeterminate lesions. It means we're not entirely sure whether this is cancer or not. Um, so what if the biopsy isn't definitive? In, in adults uh, over the past five years, a little bit longer, uh, the option of molecular testing or testing the DNA and RNA in those cells can help refine the likelihood of malignancy and they can help uh, improve the certainty of the diagnosis. And there, these tests come in two different flavors. Um, one is a type of test called a rule-in test that can identify malignant nodules. Um, and if the specific tests are positive, then it essentially confirms that a nodule is cancerous. The opposite approach is what's called a rule-out test, which means tell me if this is likely to be a benign nodule. Um, and there are a few different versions of this that are identified here. Um, and it wasn't entirely clear whether any of these would apply or be applicable in children. Uh, and without going into detail about the, uh, the data, the first category, the rule in, or the what we call the gene variant tests, are probably valid in children. 
Uh, so if one of these tests is positive, then we can believe it and we can believe that that's cancerous, although it hasn't been um, extensively confirmed or validated in, in large numbers. On the other hand, uh, one of the more common, the, what's called the gene expression classifier, classifier um, marketed as Affirma by a company called Verisite, is, is very widely used in adults. And it is not valid, was not that val developed for children and has not been validated in children. And, and as such, it really shouldn't be used um, for pediatric biopsies. The, the last group here, the microRNA based tests, have some supportive data in children, but I think the jury's still out to feel entirely confident that we can use these in pediatric samples. So, so now that we know a little bit about who develops thyroid cancer, what age and what sex, and how to diagnose this, the next question is how does thyroid cancer compare across the age span? What does it look like in children versus adults? Um, and, and there've been a number of studies that have looked at this over the last five years, five to 10 years. Um, this is one of the largest studies that comes out of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, looking at, uh, at almost 80 years of experience. They, they've been one of the, the largest centers to treat thyroid cancer for eight decades. And this looked at their experience in almost 4,500 patients. Um, and this was published by Dr. Hay and colleagues four years ago now. And, and the, the brief story is that comparing children in black to adults in gray here, children tended to have larger tumors more frequent extrathyroidal extension means spread of the cancer into the tissues surrounding the thyroid gland in the neck, um, more frequent spread to the lymph nodes of the neck and more frequent spread to the lungs, pulmonary metastases. Now it should be noted that over the 80 years of this study, both the diagnosis and treatment of thyroid cancer has changed dramatically. And so we need to sort of take that into consideration. Nonetheless, this was this is certainly an intriguing bit of data and sort of confirmed what many had already uh, recognized that children tend to have more invasive and more extensive disease. A graduate student that had been working at SickKids wanted to break this down a little bit further and specifically focus on the children and wondering if these findings applied across the pediatric age, age spectrum. And so that's shown in the, this slide here. Um, so now breaking the pediatric age group or the children into three categories, zero to 10, which was meant to be roughly the prepubertal age group, the peripubertal age group of 10 to 14 and the adolescent age group. And in this figure, the black lines show lateral metastases to the lymph nodes, meaning spread to the lymph nodes on the sides of the neck the gray is to the center, lymph nodes to the center of neck, the neck, so just those that are adjacent to the thyroid gland. And the white bars uh, show children that had no spread of uh, their thyroid cancer outside the thyroid gland itself. And you can see that the youngest patients were the ones that were most likely to have the most widespread disease. And as children progressed to older age groups, um, the extent of disease was lower. She also looked at the rates of spread to the lungs and similarly found that the youngest children were more likely to have spread to the lungs than the peripubertal children and even less so than the adolescents. Uh, and finally, she looked at spread of cancer into the blood vessels. And again, it followed the same pattern of decreasing extent with advancing age. Um, she compared these these data, so specifically focusing on the lymph nodes, to a large cancer registry across the United States, uh, which samples about 28% of the entire population of the United States. Um, and very similar data was found, now this is looking at thousands of individuals instead of tens of individuals at a single hospital, and a very similar pattern, different colors here, but you can see that lower disease extent with increasing age. And if you extend this out across the age spectrum, you can see that disease extent, uh, higher and higher proportions of individuals have no lymph node spread um, until at least their 70s and 80s where it may inflect a little bit at that point. 
with respect to lung metastases. This was her data. And again, a similar pattern that the youngest patients have the most extensive or the highest rates of lung metastases. And that goes way down into the third decades of life and stays down uh, until 70s and 80s. This latter um, finding was of particular interest to another fellow who had trained at Sick Kids, Alex Chessover, who's now at Green Ormond Street in London. And he looked at all of uh, 100 children uh, or 93 children um, at Sick Kids with a specific focus on trying to understand who were these children who were developing spread to the lungs. Um, what he found was that children under 13 years of age represented 43% of all our thyroid cancers, but 84% of those individuals with, lymph, with lung metastases. So almost twice, as, twice the proportion, much higher risk of lung metastases. Among children under 13 years of age, 40% had lung disease, whereas among adolescents, only 5% had lung disease. So lung metastases is really in, enriched for children under the age of 12 or under the age of 13. So to summarize all these data, um, children have a higher risk of malignancy in a nodule um, than adults. They have higher rates of lymph node involvement than adults, higher rates of lung metastases than adults. Um, I didn't cover this, but they're thyroid cancer is more likely to be uh, multifocal, which means multiple sites or multiple cancerous nodules. And in the first slide I showed you, the recurrence risks are higher. So really pediatric thyroid cancer seems to be a different entity. The next question that we wanted to try to understand is, is thyroid cancer in children caused by the same genetic changes as in adults? I did show you that we can use molecular testing to identify some of the genetic changes in adults. And that molecular testing looks at the DNA and the RNA in cells. And there are really two different flavors of genetic changes that drive cancer. The one that's most familiar to people is called a single nucleotide variant, um, conventionally known as a mutation or an SNV. And this is a spelling mistake in a gene, often just a single letter in the entire alphabet or encyclopedia of a gene. The other type of genetic change is called a gene fusion. And this is on a much larger scale. This is showing two different genes, a purple gene and a blue gene. Um, and a, some sort of event causes those two genes to be smushed together and produce a fusion protein, we call it, or a hybrid of the two genes. Uh, and the, the hybrid protein there together drives a cell to be to change from a normal cell to a cancerous cell. Data from a very, very large study at the National Cancer Institute in DC and across multiple, multiple different hospitals back in 2014, examined all the genetic changes in thyroid cancers in adults. They looked at 500 different individuals uh, and found that in the blue, the uh, single nucleotide variants or the, the mutations comprised 75% of the genetic changes, uh, whereas those gene fusions constituted only about 15% of those changes. Uh, Anna Stosik, who I told you about before at our institution, recapitulated this in a smaller number of children and found the distribution was very different, that 67% of children had cancers driven by the gene fusions. So, so almost a, a, a mirror image of the adults. So it's different genetic changes that cause or that are underlying cancer, thyroid cancer in children versus that in adults. As she did previously, she took the pediatric age group and broke it down a little bit further into those three categories. Um, and like with the clinical data about lymph node metastases and lung metastases, she found differences between those age groups in terms of what type of genetic change was underlying there. And again, in the youngest children, 80% um, of those had cancers that were driven by gene fusions. Uh, that was also true in the peripubertal age group. But as children entered adolescence, 
much a much higher proportion of their cancers were driven by the mutations or the single nucleotide variants. And as you met, moved into adulthood, um, that proportion grew even larger. And you can see this is that sort of mirror image developing there. Uh, at the same time that Anna was doing her research, uh, colleagues of ours in Philadelphia were looking at similar questions and they tried to understand the difference between the clinical behavior of pediatric tumors that were driven by those fusions as compared to those that were driven by the mutations or the single nucleotide variants. Um, and this was their publication from earlier this year showing that tumors that were driven by the fusions tended to be bigger than the other tumors, have more extensive lymph node metastases and have more frequent lung metastases. So this really fit with that pattern seen in the previous slide that the younger children that had more extensive lymph node metastases and more frequent lung metastases also had more gene fusions. So knowing that there are these biological and clinical differences between children, adolescents, and adults, the next question that arose was, should children be treated differently than adults? And as recently as 2009, not too long ago, the second iteration of the American Thyroid Association guidelines for patients with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer read as follows. They asked the, specifically asked the question, how should thyroid nodules in children be managed? And their recommendation at the time was that the diagnostic and therapeutic approach to one or more thyroid nodules in child should be the same as it would be in an adult. Um, and this, as I said, came out in 2009, and it didn't sit particularly well um, with my colleagues. I wasn't involved at the time because of many of the things that I've just told you. Um, there are a number of similarities um, in children with respect to thyroid cancer um, as uh, when compared to adults. They show up similarly to medical attention, either as a asymptomatic mass or an incidental finding on imaging. We use similar tools. We use ultrasound, we use cytopathology to diagnose. The ultrasound features overlap, even if the risk of malignancy is different and the risk factors are largely the same. However, there are a number of differences as well. Um, as I told you, there are higher rates of malignant nodules um, in children. Um, the adult ultrasound and cytology underestimates the risk of malignancy. I'll tell you in, in a couple of slides that surgical complication rates are different in children and adults, and this can impact decisions about treatment. Recurrence rates we already know are higher in children. A child diagnosed such as Hari at age 10 is inevitably gonna survive longer than an adult, um, or at least that's our goal of treatment. And we know that fate, that mortality is very, very low. Um, and that means they're going to be living with the sequelae of their treatment for decades. And children, not surprisingly, have different developmental and psychological needs that need to be considered. As a result of these, this, um, the group lobbied to produce uh, separate pediatric focus guidelines. And these were released in 2015 as the initial management guidelines for children with thyroid nodules and differentiated thyroid cancer. And this was really a, a landmark episode in the treatment of, of this pediatric population. More recently, over the last couple of years, uh, pediatric guidelines have been released in the United Kingdom uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, imminently there will be European guidelines, Japanese guidelines, and version two of the American Thyroid Association guidelines. And these pediatric treatment guidelines try to integrate experience specific to disease behavior in children. It stratifies care so that children with the highest risk of recurrence will undergo the most comprehensive treatment However, those with lower risk may be candidates for less aggressive therapy. Uh, and this was a, a major innovation in these guidelines because prior to this, more or less all children with thyroid cancer were treated equally. Um, and of course the pediatric guidelines consider the additional risks and needs 
that are inherent to the pediatric population. So what about new treatments? Um, and this is an area of some uh, frustration for me. Um, and this is uh, a website, clinicaltrials.gov. It's um, accessible to anyone on the internet. And it's a, it's a database of all active clinical trials registered um, with this website. And if one goes to clinicaltrials.gov, this was last night, and searches for thyroid cancer, um, there are 195 studies listed in the database that are currently recruiting um, different treatment uh, research studies for individuals with thyroid cancer. If you use the same database and limit this search um, to those uh, studies that are recruiting that include children uh, under the age of 18, you can see that there are only 32 studies that are open to children um, under the age of 18. So even though children have more invasive disease, um, they're not often eligible for some of the studies that are being conducted um, to help identify novel or um, innovative approaches to treatment. Uh, and we're left to extrapolate the adult data to children. We're getting close to the end here, uh, and I'll certainly leave plenty of time for questions and, and discussion. The next question that comes about is, what happens to a child who's diagnosed with thyroid cancer? What, what happens, what is the outcome? Uh, and this was addressed a little bit in the first slide I showed you, and this is it again. Uh, and I told you that, that cancer death in those diagnosed in childhood is extremely, extremely rare. A couple of slides ago, I did mention to you that surgical complications were different um, in children. And the study from about uh, 14 years ago now um, shows us that complication rates um, are highest in the youngest children. And they seem to decrease with advancing age through the pediatric age group. And the length of stay that children are in the hospital after their surgery is longer in the youngest children. And this is a, a consideration for what children should undergo surgery. Um, ideally, one would wanna minimize this and take measures not just limiting surgery to these individuals, but identifying surgical approaches and surgical teams um, that are most experienced uh, in treating the youngest children so as to minimize their complication risk. Another study, this was Sarah Hampson, who is a medical student um, at the time, uh, looked at whether based on age, how likely is a child to achieve a disease-free status? Um, are they likely, this is this NED means no evidence of disease. And she found that a significant difference in those diagnosed under the age of 12 were far less likely to those diagnosed in adolescence to reach that state of disease remission or undetectable disease. And finally, Alex, who I mentioned to you before, who was interested in understanding children with disease that had spread to the lungs, wanted to know what specifically was the outcome for those children who were diagnosed with lung metastases. Uh, and this is a patient that I cared for a number of years ago, and this is the outcome that we hope for for all of our patients. This is a young lady. Um, this is a radioactive iodine uptake scan, and it's a little bit unclear, but her head is here, her arms are here, and you can see all the black spots are areas where thyroid tissue took up iodine um, throughout her lungs. This was her initial radioactive iodine treatment. A year later, there was no detectable disease. Uh, and the other measure that we use to look for evidence of thyroid disease is a thyroglobulin. Um, and although it took a few years um, after a single treatment with radioactive iodine, she reached that state of undetectable disease, both biochemically and by imaging. And this is, our, this is our, our intended and our ideal outcome. A number of studies in the past few years have looked at the response in children with lung metastases. Um, and the outcome isn't as promising, unfortunately. Um, across these four different studies, um, the number of children who end up achieving a complete response to therapy is anywhere from zero to 16%. So a fairly low rate of cure. Most children 
have what we call either a partial response or stable disease and very, very low rates of death as a result of disease. Going back to the study from the Mayo Clinic with their 80 years of experience, they looked specifically at those children shown here that had distant spread or lung metastases at diagnosis and their mortality rate over 80 years was zero. Um, so children are not dying of disease. And you compare that to adults with lung metastases where the rate is much higher. And this is a hugely important difference and one that I spend a lot of time sharing with my adult colleagues um, as I transition my patients from pediatric to adult care, um, because I think it's important that they recognize that the outcome for these individuals is generally extremely favorable and that one needs to temper aggressive treatment um, based on that projected favorable outcome. I did mention briefly uh, previously that there are a lot of new medications that are available for children or for, for individuals with advanced thyroid cancer. And every rectangle here illustrates another uh, novel, fairly novel drug that's available to treat the different genetic lesions that cause thyroid cancer. Um, and many of these uh, agents are being used in children now. So going back to Hari, this is his CT scan at the time he was diagnosed. This is his lungs. Um, and lungs generally should be relatively black. There are a number of white spots in there. And all of these white spots that aren't lines, uh, all of these white spots are thyroid cancer deposits or metastases. Um, and he underwent two sessions of radioactive iodine. And four years later, unfortunately, the the lung disease had spread quite a bit. And you can see that there are many more white spots and that they're larger. This constitutes something called radioiodine refractory disease, um, seen very infrequently in children. Um, and he was having, although relatively asymptomatic, was having some trouble uh, with, with vigorous exercise. We were able to do genetic testing on his tumor and it identified a mutation in one of those gene fusions called a, a RET fusion. Um, and it so happened that there is one of those medications available to treat children with RET fusions or anyone with RET fusions called sulpercatinib. And we were able to start treating him with this. And within two months of treatment, you can see that there were far fewer lung metastases and much smaller. And in fact, now he's two years off on treatment um, and his lung metastases have almost disappeared entirely. This is very encouraging. And for those individuals um, who meet criteria for treatment, uh, this is really an option that we haven't had in the past uh, and very appropriate and uh, optimistic. But we do need to be cautious about treating these individuals. I did tell you that the survival is near 100%. Um, and that means that children are living for decades after their initial treatment. And as physicians, one of our, our roles is to ensure that we cause no harm as a result of our treatments. This is a study that came out earlier this year, looking at those treated for thyroid cancer in childhood over a period of decades after treatment. And you can see on the, the horizontal line here, the axis is in years, and we're looking at 10, 10 20, 30, and 40 years. Um, and this study did show that those treated with radioactive iodine in the blue compared to those without radioactive iodine in the red had higher rates of developing new secondary tumors um, starting at about 20 years after their treatment. So long after they've left the pediatric sphere. Um, and I'll just, I'm not gonna go into great depth about this because there's a talk, I believe it's at 5.30 today, um, which I'm highlighting here, which I, I'm actually looking forward to attending as well, um, specifically focusing on the risks of radioactive iodine treatment. This doesn't mean we should avoid it, but we should be considering the benefits of treatment versus the risks. There are other potential side effects of radioactive iodine, including salivary gland dysfunction, lung fibrosis, potentially subfertility and cardiovascular disease, but the data are, are pretty challenging here. So treatment of children with advanced papillary thyroid carcinoma, meaning that 
that which is spread outside of the neck is really a balancing act. And as patients, as parents, and as clinicians, we, on one hand, really want to achieve the greatest clearance of disease. We want to get rid of as much of the cancer as we can. We want to limit symptoms that may be attributable to disease, whether that's from mass uh, compression in the neck or if there's breathing problems. Um, and potentially, we want to aim for undetectable disease. Uh, but we do have to recognize that pediatric papillary thyroid ca cancer is generally asymptomatic. It's not associated with increased mortality. Um, and it's often not curable, as I showed you with those four recent studies looking at lung disease. So we do need to avoid complications that we cause that will impact an individual's quality of life. And those complications include short-term complications from surgery, including hypoparathyroidism and nerve damage as well as decades later complications, because our goal is to ensure that our patients remain healthy for decades. And that includes some of the effects of, of the radioactive iodine that I talked about in the previous slide. So the challenges to those of us who treat children with lung disease in childhood is that the overall survival is excellent, cure is rare, survivors are living with disease for decades, and they're living with the consequences of treatment for decades as well. So many questions remain. How do we balance the priorities of disease remission with risks of late developing complications of treatment, meaning years or decades after their initial diagnosis? Which children should be treated with those new therapies? Uh, knowing that lung metastases often don't progress, they don't grow, unlike with Harry. Uh, and are rarely fatal. As with Harry, we don't know how long to keep treating and whether now that Harry's disease looks like it's been largely reduced, should we continue treating him or should we discontinue treatment? These are fairly new drugs. And so we don't know what the late effects of these medications are. We've probably got about five to seven years of experience, but we don't know uh, what to expect decades later. And that's something that's of ongoing research. Um, and there have been fairly few children treated with these medications. Most of the data are from adults. Um, and so there's the possibility that there are effects on the developing child who has different biology than the adult. Um, and we need to be cautious of that. So I hope I've shown you the, the different faces of thyroid cancer across the age spectrum, comparing Hari at 10 years old with fairly extensive disease to his mother at uh, treated at 43 years old, who had more restricted disease and who uh, underwent a lobectomy rather than a total thyroidectomy, and then compared to Monica, who's somewhere in the middle, uh, as adolescents tend to be. This figure sort of summarizes what I've told you, that children in green here uh, are more likely to have spread to the lymph nodes of the neck, and more likely about half of them have lung metastases and their cancer tends to be driven in the dark shaded by gene fusions, whereas adults, N0 means no lymph node metastases, so much more likely to have no lymph node metastases, no lung metastases, and their cancers are driven by single nucleotide variants or mutations. And the adolescents stand somewhere in between the two. So my final slide, children present with different disease than in adults and require a tailored approach to diagnosis and treatment using pediatric specific guidelines. Younger children trend to more invasive disease and adolescence is a transition period between childhood and adult disease um, and between childhood and adulthood in general. Uh, gene fusions predominate in youth and are associated with higher risk of metastasis uh, and survival is excellent, and thus aggressiveness of treatment should be balanced against perceived benefit. So with that, I will open the floor to questions, and I'll ask Lindsay to help yeah. uh, mediate. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rossman. That was great. Um, we do have a few minutes left for questions, so it looks like we've got two in the queue, um, but if anyone else uh, listening in has questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A chat box. Um, so the first question, can you comment on the accuracy of FNA in children diagnosed with follicular carcinoma? 
My children's FNA was negative. However, when we removed her thyroid, it was positive for cancer. And I know it's fine needle aspiration, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to speak when reading the question. <laughs> so, so it's a very good question. Follicular carcinoma is a very um, specific type of thyroid cancer. It's quite rare in children. Um, and it is um, less, uh, the FNA is less accurate for follicular carcinoma. Um, much of the diagnosis of follicular carcinoma is really based on the histology, which means the examine, examination of the tumor specimen after it's removed. Um, so it can be very challenging to diagnose whether in adults or children. We really don't have any data that I'm aware of specific to pediatric follicular carcinoma. Um, so I would, this is one of those situations where we have to um, extrapolate from adults with um, follicular carcinoma um, and, and it is, it can be challenging. So it's not an entirely um, surprising uh, story to hear. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next individual uh, indicates her mom was diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer at 68 and had a thyroidectomy. Uh, she was diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer at 40 with a thyroidectomy and REI. Um, they've done ultrasound surveillance for five of her children. Three of the five do have nodules. Two of those nodules were biopsied in 2020. Um, how often would you recommend the children be seen for follow-up? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting and a question that comes up not infrequently. Um, thyroid cancer is fairly common, as you know, in the population, particularly in, in women. It's, it's, as far as I know now, you know, I think it's now reached the second most common cancer diagnosis in, in women in the United States. Um, and thyroid nodules are even more common. Um, when we look at whether or not it tends to run in families, it can be a little bit challenging. Even if there are two family members that are affected by thyroid cancer, the likelihood statistically is, is believe it or not, still that it's due to chance. Um, and once there's a third family member that's diagnosed, then it sort of swings the pendulum to thinking that it may actually be genetic, although we don't really have any good genetic tests for that. Um, so this, this uh, Charisse is, is sort of on that borderline between two and three. Um, and then the other challenge is that thyroid nodules are, are not uncommon in the population. So if we were to offer everyone in the population ultrasounds, many would have thyroid nodules that may be there all their lives and never come to attention. Um, the, it's, it's hard to know without knowing the results of the biopsy. If the biopsy was benign, it should be fairly reassuring. Um, and, and generally we would suggest probably following those up after two or three years. But the, 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 the follow-up of benign of nodules that have benign biopsies um, can be an area of controversy, mm. but, but I think it can be reassuring and, and not need to be done any more than every couple of years. Okay. And then uh, you mentioned uh, there not being great genetic uh, testing, but the next question is asking, would gene testing pick up gene fusion in siblings? Yeah, so there, there's actually the genetic testing, um, and this is a, a larger um, explanation, but there are two different um, aspects that we can test. There's genes that are passed on from generation to generation, um, and that testing is done based on generally on blood samples. And then there's different gene testing. And what I was talking about mostly in this talk was gene testing of the tumor itself. Um, so gen gene fusions are the ones that occur in the tumor itself. So they wouldn't be picked up in blood testing or in gen genetic, what we call germline testing of the blood. So gene testing would not be appropriate to look for fusions um, unless those two siblings had two, both had thyroid cancer, but that would be very unlikely even then to be picking up gene fusions in the same gene fusion in two siblings. So it's not something that would be advocated. Okay. 
Uh, the next question, would it be possible for an adult diagnosed with NTRK fusion? Is it possible that they had it as a, a child, you know, pediatric, but not detected until later? It's a good question. It, it, we certainly know that, N, that children are more likely to have NTRK fusion driven cancers than adults. Um, it's sort of an unanswerable question without being able to go back in time and look in childhood, but it's unlikely. I, I would say um, it's not impossible, but probably adults do get NTRK fusion driven cancers. And I think it's, it's fairly unlikely that that has been there for a long time and not picked up. And then it looks like the last question we have here is a follow-up. Why is follow-up of benign nodules controversial? So, so what's controversial is we don't really know once a, once a biopsy is benign, and this is probably going to be different a little bit from children and, and adults, but once it's benign, whether one can be satisfied, certainly in adults, one can probably generally satisfied um, and either not continue to monitor that nodule at all or one further ultrasound, and if it hasn't changed, um, then you can stop doing ultrasounds. At some point, you believe that this is a benign nodule, and uh, we don't think there's a high rate of benign nodules becoming cancerous. So what the, the controversy is um, whether one needs, once have, one has a benign biopsy, whether one does need to uh, continue to ultrasound and how, when do you stop ultrasounding? Um, but it's certainly not once you know that it's a benign nodule, um, at some point, it's not lifelong follow-up. You can believe it's benign and not need to treat it. Okay. Uh, it looks like we've got two minutes left, so I'll try to get through at least one, maybe two more questions. Uh, the next individual uh, indicates her daughter had follicular thyroid cancer and it spread to the lung. Uh, the surgeon started by taking one side of the thyroid, later going back in to do total thyroidectomy, and they did not have the luxury of having a pediatric thyroid specialist, so they're now working through two-year follow-up after RAI. Um, and then the next individual, uh, her daughter received a diagnosis on Monday with the pathology report post-thyroidectomy. She has papillary with follicular variant. Um, She'd like to know if only five lymph nodes were examined, how do we know there aren't more affected nodes? So, so thanks for that question. Um, the, the surgeons, and sorry, in response to the previous, I'm not sure that there was a question in the previous yeah. uh, story, so I don't know quite how to answer that. But with respect to the question about the young lady who was just diagnosed on Monday, um, generally the, the surgeon will um, focus, the surgeons will perform what's called a compartment-oriented resection. It means they don't remove only the lymph nodes that, they, that look to be abnormal, but they leave, remove all the lymph nodes in a particular area. Um, and the surgery will be more extensive if there's ultrasound or CT evidence that, that they need to go wider in terms of their surgery. Um, after the surgery, the, the first thing that's done it's somewhere between one to two months afterwards is what's called staging, which is a reevaluation using both uh, initially blood tests to identify whether there's any evidence that there's any cancer remaining. Um, and if that's the case, um, your daughter may be, um, may be recommended to undergo uh, what's called a radio iodine uptake scan to look for remaining disease. And that will identify if there are additional lymph nodes or other sites where the disease has spread to. Um, and, and based on the results of that, the, the medical team will help recommend whether, if, if that is positive, whether the next line of treatment would be um, further surgery or treatment called radioactive iodine therapy. Uh, however, often when there's one out of five lymph nodes, um, there's very little, if any, remaining uh, cancer. And so no further treatment is often necessary. Okay, I think that uh, rounds out our time here. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Wassman, for spending your time with us this afternoon.
I hope everyone enjoyed this session and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks very much, Lindsay.